everyone. So on behalf of the ISS, it's my pleasure to extend um, all of you a very warm welcome to Berlin and to our panel discussion, which is going to be about sea and air traversing the ocean climate divide in international law and policy, which is in connection with the European Maritime Week. Now, this is a very important event on the impacts of CO2 on the marine environment is being co-convened by our partner, the IUCN, to whom I would like to express my gratitude. My name is Mark Lawrence. I'm a scientific director at the ISS of the research cluster CEWA, which stands for Sustainable Interactions with the Atmosphere. And our mission at the ISS is to develop transformative knowledge, which is needed to pave the way towards sustainable societies in the Anthropocene. Together with our partners in academia, government, business, civil society, and the broader public, we aim to develop solutions for urgent sustainability challenges and to support national and international decision-making processes. The topics of discussion tonight are at the cross-section of two of the research clusters of the IASS, the Global Contract for Sustainability, or GCS, led by Klaus Töpfer, and represented tonight by Sebastian Unger, and the CEWA cluster that I lead. Now, some of you may be joining us from the Climate Engineering Conference, the CEC 14, which is convening critical global discussions on one of the major research topics of the CEWA cluster. The connection between the CEC 14 and this panel discussion becomes evident if we consider what's written about the proposed climate engineering techniques in a recent policy paper released by the Global Ocean Commission. Some of these technologies use the oceans, and all could affect it. The issues around climate engineering and its impacts on the oceans, however, is only one facet of our discussion this evening. The broader concerns, the broader focus concerns what has been referred to as the deadly trio of global warming, ocean acidification, and deoxygenation, key problems at the interface between global oceans and climate governance. A central theme in tonight's discussion is exchanges, and I'd like to consider two particular examples of these kinds of exchanges. First, a focus will be on the exchange between the sea and the air and the vital role of the oceans in the functioning of the climate system as a whole. The vast majority of CO2 enters the oceans via passive uptake from the atmosphere. The oceans have absorbed approximately a quarter of our CO2 emissions, about 80% of the thermal energy added to the climate system as a result of the greenhouse effect. Now these are part of the complex interactions in the climate system that we need to understand as a basis of guiding future environmental decision making. But scientific understanding alone won't solve our problems. Another kind of exchange that is needed for that, which is called to mind by the composition of this panel, namely an effective exchange between scientists and policy and lawmakers. Cross and transdisciplinary dialogue is not always easy, since we often use different terminology and tend to see the problem from our own particular perspectives. However, it's imperative that we work through these challenges towards an informed, integrated view of the socio-ecological system, which is needed as the basis for developing improved governance and international environmental law capable of coping with global environmental change. Tonight, having gathered together scientists, international lawyers, economists, and governance experts, we should hear many insights and lessons from the past about this kind of exchange and approaches towards better integrating international law and policy across environmental regimes. So I'd like to thank everyone in attendance tonight for your interest and your participation in this con important conversation. On behalf of the IASS, I hope that it is just the start of an ongoing lively exchange that will help bring about a more sustainable framework for confronting climate change and the protection of our seas and oceans. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, good evening uh, and welcome, uh, dear participants and distinguished panel. My name is Sebastian Unger, and I was introduced by Mark as representative of the other research cluster at the ISS, led by um, Klaus Töpfer. Um, the upcoming uh, period um, promises some stimulating discussions for global sustainability, in particular for the oceans and the climate front. Over the next 18 months, global um, society and uh, policy making will need to reach agreement on a new instrument for protecting the areas beyond national jurisdiction, often referred to the high seas, which is 
um, covering half of the Earth's surface. It's the largest global commons. We are about to define sustainable development goals, one of which will address the oceans and coast. And last but not least, we are, will be setting the international framework to promote collective action on climate change during the Paris um, Climate Conference at the end of 2015. All of these streams will give us an opportunity to close what we frame here today as the climate-ocean divide. When the German Advisory Council on Global Change published its special report on climate and the ocean already in 2006, the title very much summarized uh, the future of our ocean. It was warming up, rising high, turning sour. And it's now almost 10 years ago that this report was covered, but the marine environmental protection community very much still looks for appropriate answers to this main pressure on the oceans. Now, I've experienced this myself personally when I was working with the OSPA Commission. That's the mechanism through which the states in Europe and the European community cooperate to protect the marine environment of the Northeast Atlantic. And in OSPA, it was clearly identified and there was agreement among states that the climate change effects, ocean acidification, are the, or one of the main threats to the marine environment, are threatening human well-being in the Northeast Atlantic region. But still, we are looking for adequate responses to um, answers to this main threat from the environmental protection side. Possible measures range from reducing overall pressure on species and ecosystems to increase the resilience of ecosystems and, for example, through networks of marine protected areas, which can play an important role in, 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 in enhancing the capacity of ecosystems to resist to the pressures of climate change. Marine spatial planning and integrated coastal zone management are similar, very important tools and can help to, um, to keep this function of marine ecosystems. Attention should also be given to the conservation and restoration of natural coastal um, carbon sinks such as mangroves. And if well coordinated, all these elements could be part of uh, a solution to address climate change in the marine area. On the other hand, um, on, the, on the other side of the equation, the climate change negotiation strand, um, people are an expert, are very much aware of the effects of climate change on the oceans, but um, dynamics in UNFCCC make it, to say the least, very unclear if in the upcoming negotiations oceans will play, play a prominent role. I'm very much looking forward. We have some distinguished experts on this field here today to learn more about possible leverages or possible hooks to get the ocean more integrated in this, in this arena. Please allow me a very few words on our work at the ISS to, to cl close my, my opening. We uh, at the ISS, as Mark already indicated, work in an integrated way on um, oceans, on the atmosphere, on soils. And um, within ocean governance, we very much address high seas issues. And um, for um, sort of improving the governance of these areas, we bring together science, policy making, and, and other stakeholders. And I'm, I'm very happy to see some faces like Christina Jerdy or Rosemary Rafius, distinguished experts in this field. We are collaborate, collaborating already with um, marine systems are interconnected with atmospheric and terrestrial systems. And this requires governance systems that are actually capable of addressing these connections um, between these major compartments of the Earth system. And a special emphasis that there is therefore given at our work at these nexus topics like land-ocean connections, or as we are discussing here today, uh, on the um, link between the oceans and the atmosphere. And progress in these interstitials will be very important to um, achieve um, sustainability governance in the future. Thank you very much um, um, to my colleagues uh, from the SIVA cluster for organizing this, to IUCN, uh, our partner, and bringing this panel together. And I'm um, really looking forward to this timely discussion um, that will also perhaps help us to shape some ideas in the run-up of um, discussions of the um, 2015 climate talks. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, everyone. It is my great pleasure to be here this evening to introduce the, the session that is really dealing with some of the critical issues of today.
Uh, thanks to Mark and to Sebastian for helping to set the context for this evening discussions, as well as for uh, Dorothy Hare and um, Anna Maria Hubert for organizing this specific session. Uh, but I will keep my comments short. Uh, my name is Christina Jurdy. I'm High Seas Policy Advisor to IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Um, my focus is on ways to improve the governance and management of the global ocean commons. The atmosphere, of course, is inextricably linked to how we manage our global ocean commons. Among other ocean-related topics, IUCN has long been concerned about the impacts of greenhouse gases on the ocean and the lack of an appropriate response from international bodies to integrate the full spectrum of ocean threats into management responses for fishing, for shipping, and now for seabed mining. The situation today at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, known as the UNFCCC, with respect to ocean acidification is one significant example. As we have heard from Mark and Sebastian, the global ocean is at the front lines of climate change. The ocean, through its absorptive and buffering capacities, has played a key role in reducing the impacts of climate change on land. But these benefits come at a high cost to the marine environment in the face of the so-called deadly trio of impacts, including, or which are, ocean acidification, warming, and deoxygenation. While, under, while scientists understand that climate and oceans function as an integrated system, international law and policy, my world, for the protection of the marine environment and atmosphere are fragmented and uncoordinated. But time is running out. If we are to bring about the recovery and maintenance of our global ocean commons, IUCN and IU, IASS are very interested in generating a platform for discussion of how to better address this fragmentation through a more integrative and coordinated approach to ocean and climate change issues. This evening's event will hopefully kickstart a much broader discussion. And now over to my co-moderator, Torsten Thiele. Welcome also on my part. My name is Torsten Thiele, and the focus of my research is how ocean governance can be enhanced using new technologies and uh, new sources of finance. I'm delighted to introduce our first two speakers, both leading ocean scientists that are actively involved in the international policy debate. First up is Professor Dr. Hans Otto Pörtner, who runs the Ocean Warming and Acidification Research Program at the Alfred Wegener Institute for Polar and Marine Research in Germany. Professor Partner will introduce us to the issues of ocean warming and oxygen deficiency. He is a leading expert with numerous publications and high-level appointments and acted as the coordinating lead author of the new chapter on ocean ecosystems in the latest IPCC assessment report. We're keen to learn to what extent the oceans are now included, Professor Partner. Thank you very much for your kind introduction and thanks a lot for the opportunity to be here and summarize for you a little bit what the IPCC has done in the, in the ocean context, looking at climate change impacts on, on the oceans and identifying the crucial processes uh, that, are, that are involved. Now, if we, if we just uh, memorize what the oceans are doing for us in terms of regulating the climate system, we've heard about that. They are they are absorbing more than 90% of the heat. They are delaying climate change for the terrestrial uh, environment, which is good, uh, but also bad, because it keeps us waiting too long until we uh, take any measures. And certainly for the oceans, the result is ocean warming and then stratification and oxygen deficiency. They absorb 25% of the man-made CO2, and this causes the issue of ocean acidification, as we've already heard. And then they accumulate excess water from melting ice sheets and causing global sea level rise. These are the global challenges that are involved with the oceans on the, on the physical side. And these uh, challenges combine with more local issues that are also due to human activities, which are overfishing, pollution, eutrophication, uh, deoxygenation, especially in, in coastal areas due to eutrophication, 
the formation of harmful algal blooms, and another issue uh, is the redistribution of pathogens, for example, like, like cholera. And with this summary, I would just uh, like to emphasize that presently, certainly, temperature is the key driver of ongoing global changes. And ocean acidification is starting and has started, and uh, we are seeing the first effects, but we are uh, projecting more effects to set in uh, in the time to come. Now, what has Working Group 2 that I've been involved in in coordinating this chapter on ocean systems, what has uh, Working Group 2 done about assessing uh, the effects of climate change? And one key concept was addressing the risk issue, quantifying, trying to qualify more than quantify probably the level of risk involved in any uh, process and change and putting it into a kind time context, looking at present and then looking at the near term, sort of the committed climate change future for the next 20, 30 years, and, and then looking at the long term by the end of the century, comparing a two degree and a four degree world. And just for an arbitrary example, you see the risk increasing here. And then another issue is, what can humankind do about risk? And what can, do, and what can natural systems do about risk? Uh, risk? And then certainly an issue is identifying key risks, which we can see as the ones relevant to Article 2 of the UNFCCC, those that involve dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. Certainly a value judgment involved, but an important one to uh, look at these issues. Adaptation is involved, and adaptation is very important at a local and at a global scale to reduce such risk. And the question then is, to what extent adaptation can do so? And we, can, we certainly have to distinguish the various sectors and, and aspects uh, that are being impacted by climate change. So these are the principles, and I will be coming back to that later. Now, what are we observing in the ocean presently? What we are seeing is a displacement of organisms, and that's certainly a very important uh, issue to to address and consider whenever you, you think about nature conservation because the organisms that you want to conserve may no longer be there due to climate change once you have set an area aside. So this affects virtually all groups of organisms and has affected, and this is the observation side. There's a worldwide marine species displacement due to climate change by several uh, kilometers per decade, up to 400 uh, kilometers per decade for the group of, of phytoplankton and zooplankton co is covered by, by these observations and that's due to the global warming trend in the oceans. And then we can take these observations, understanding the principles and take them into projections and project what will be happening in the future in the world's oceans. And this is a picture of what the world's ocean may look like with respect to the presence of, of species in the 2050s of, of this century. And what you see here, represented by the dark colors, are an enrichment of species diversity. Organisms having been pushed towards the poles by several hundreds and thousands of kilometers. And then at the low latitudes, you see an impoverishment of species diversity. You see, a, you see a reduction of species diversity, and especially the local fisheries there will no longer find or hardly find the species that they commonly fished for. And that is certainly posing uh, pressure upon the human system to uh, undergo some, some adaptation. And this is what we have done in terms of the risk assessment for these processes. What you see here is for the different time scales again, the risk, the rising uh, risk associated with the vanishing marine resources. Certainly, there is room, room for adaptation in each of those. Sorry for that. Adaptation certainly is easy, and this will immediately be clear if it comes to industrial fishing. You just send your fishing fleet somewhere else, and the distance really doesn't play much of a role. But if it, if it comes to local fishery, fisheries, they are extremely limited in their adaptation capacity, and especially the developing nations will find it very difficult to, to um, 
undergo this kind of adaptation. And these are the countries that rely most on, on the uh, f fisheries as a, as a source of animal protein. So there's uh, reduced livelihoods and increased poverty to be expected from these kind of changes. And then there's the issue of ocean acidification. We will hear, be hearing more about this from Jean-Pierre Gattuso. Uh, what this figure actually shows is, is sort of a, the acidification trend as it develops by the end of this century, especially large in the high latitudes, affecting, as you see here, the, the localities where we find the cold water coral reefs and also the areas where we find the green, the, the green dots are the warm water coral reefs. And the yellow areas here designate those areas where there is a lot of fisheries for, for bivalves and, and for other calcifying species like among crustaceans. Certainly we wonder how these organisms respond to these challenges. And according to a meta-analysis, we see that the number of species in each of those animal phyla differs depending on the CO2 levels that we look at. So there's a high sensitivity groups like the mollusks and the warm water corals contrasting the crustaceans and the cold water corals <laughs> that are less sensitive. And we can make some projections how these species will fare or will not fare uh, in, in the future. As I said, we will hear more about that. I will just want to uh, uh, to mention here that the risks involved with ocean acidification are enhanced by warming extremes because the two stresses come together here. And if we talk about the risk over time, you see there's very little room for adaptation here. Risks will be developing very strongly by the end of the century and there is little room for adaptation in the fishery sector for this um, issue. And let's wait for the next talk by Jean-Pierre Gattuso, who will look at this in a little bit more detail. Now, the third stressor that has already mentioned is that the oceans are losing oxygen. And here are the projections at a global scale. And at the global scale, the number of percentages that actually the ocean oxygen content, uh, content will change is rather limited. But if we look at it from a more regional aspect, then the areas in the oceans that have very low oxygen concentrations will expand largely and affect marine life in those areas. And this, these marine organisms are sensitive to the issue. You see here the oxygen concentration, and you see here that the larger organisms, the fishes and so forth, live in those areas where oxygen concentration goes above a threshold of about 60 micromoles per liter. And oxygen tensions, oxygen concentrations are prone to fall below. And if this happens, what this does, it benefits the microbes and the smaller animals that are hypoxia tolerant. The body size dependence of this is emphasized in this one here because we see that the larger individuals respond more sensitively to the decline in oxygen concentration in the ocean. We can certainly look at each of these stressors in isolation first. That's what we usually do in laboratory in, in experiments, but we must be aware that these stressors come together. And the strongest impacts we expect where warming, acidification, and hypoxia come together, indicating that assessments based on individual drivers must be considered conservative. Now let's look at the last stressor that I would like to mention, and that is the one of sea level rise. And I would like to go beyond 2100 here and consider the different climate scenarios, as you see here, in accordance with the level of atmospheric CO2, which is really the key driver correlated with the degree of warming. You see different steady state temperatures reached over time, and what you see here is you see different levels of sea level rise, and some of these values go up to six or seven meters, but the range of uncertainty is really high according to the modeling. Here it is important to consider the paleo observations. And if we consider that the last time 
the Earth has been 0.7 to 2 degrees warmer than pre-industrial. About 120,000 years ago, we had 5 to 9 meters more sea level. And if we look at the last time, when the atmosphere had 400 ppm CO2, the level that we currently have, we had more than 7 meters sea level rise. So we are looking into a future which really depends on how we will handle the emissions and whether emissions will continue unabated as they are currently doing. And if we do the risk assessment here, these risks are especially high for the small island states because they have a high ratio of coastal area to land mass and they will find it especially difficult to maintain coastal uh, areas and management of their soils and freshwater resources, leading us to set the risk levels extremely high there. Just to mention towards the end, two very sensitive ecosystems in the oceans, and these are the coral reefs. The first and the most important one, most prominent one probably, but you see what will happen with the degree of warming extremes. A healthy reef will undergo bleaching and turn into a desert if the period of bleaching is too long. And we are currently already seeing a loss of live coral cover in many of the main prominent reefs like the Gariparia reefs with different stresses involved like a starfish, extreme events like cyclones, and to some extent temperature-induced bleaching, and that component will certainly get larger in the future. And if we look at those projections and what they tell us, then they give us something like a threshold, that glo if global mean temperature would go beyond 1.2 degrees above pre-industrial, then we would lose more than 50% of the world's coral reefs. Certainly a number to memorize if it comes to climate negotiations. And the second ecosystems I would just like to mention is the Arctic sea ice ecosystem where we, according to the projections, by the mid of this century, under the highest RCP scenarios, we will see summer free, summer ice free Arctic in, and we will certainly can imagine immediately what this means for the ice for the ecosystem that is bound to the presence, structural presence of Arctic sea ice. With that, I would like to summarize with a view of risks that are involved with, this, uh, with the world oceans and just conclude with a simple mes uh, message that with unabated climate change, we have increasing risks for most of these systems and for, for many of those, adaptation is very, adaptation capacity is very limited and the capacity to re reduce risk that way is very limited. And with that, I would like to conclude. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Pertner. Uh, our second speaker is Professor Jean-Pierre Capuso, CNRS Research Professor at the Laboratoire d'Oceanographie de Villefranche and at the University Pierre et Marie Curie uh, in Paris, and he will particularly focus on that third challenge of acidification. Professor Gattuso acted as scientific coordinator of the large-scale integrated European project on ocean acidification, EPOCA. He is also the founding president of the European Geosciences Union, the Biogeosciences Division, and founding editor-in-chief of the journal Biogeosciences. Professor Gattuso is a key member of the IUCN-led International Ocean Acidification Reference User Group. Professor Gattuso. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to give this uh, short presentation. I will use, uh, as for those 10 minutes, uh, this uh, will be my uh, outline. This is a figure which is uh, from the uh, IPCC report. It's a cross-chapter box on ocean acidification, which uh, tries to summarize and um, the situation with respect to the chemistry the, of ocean acidification, the changes to organisms and ecosystems, socioeconomic impacts, and the policy options for action. So I will go through it uh, in the next uh, nine slides. Uh, but before that, I would like to indicate how young ocean acidification is as a research field. Uh, this is the number of papers published per year uh, 
And you see that uh, very few papers were published until 2004, 2005. And this, the topic is really booming. Just last year, in 2013, more than 500 papers were published uh, involving more, uh, about 2,000 scientists. So uh, the chemistry of ocean acidification, as several people indicated before, uh, the, the crux of the problem is the fact that the oceans are uh, absorbing about a quarter today of uh, the CO2 emissions. It's uh, about 24 million tons CO2 every day, which is a good thing because it's moderating climate change. But uh, um, when uh, CO2 gets into the water, it combines with water to to produce carbonic acid. Uh, therefore, the acidity of the oceans uh, increases and pH uh, decreases. We estimate that uh, the acidity of the surface ocean has increased by 30% or so uh, during uh, the past uh, 250 years. And uh, it may well reach levels which have not been seen at least for the past 55 million years uh, by the year 2100. That's a 150% uh, um, increase in ocean's acidity, concentration of protons. And this is, uh, you will not find someone denying the fact that the oceans are acidifying because it can be measured and there are several sites uh, in, in the world where uh, uh, pH is measured. and. Uh, all those sites indicate a decline of ocean pH as a, a function of time, even though those time series are relatively short. So for the chemistry, I mean, there is a very high degree of confidence about the chemistry that ocean acidification is happening, and it will continue to do so um, uh, as uh, CO2 emissions continue or increase. The changes to organisms and ecosystems. Uh, as I said, a young field of research, uh, the first experiments were performed really um, in the early 1990s. Um, most uh, calcifying species uh, seem to uh, be negatively affected by uh, ocean acidification. The reason is, one of the reasons is that uh, the concentration of carbonate, which is one of the building block of uh, the skeleton and shells of calcifying organisms, is getting depleted and is becoming, its concentration is becoming limited. We also see changes in the diversity of, uh, of um, pelagic and benthic uh, systems when uh, ocean acidity is high, impacts on food chain and ecosystems, biodiversity loss, which is observed mostly uh, near CO2 vents at uh, pH levels expected for 2100, and also possibly changes in biogas production and feedback to climate. The point is that uh, those biological and ecological effects, we have, for some of them, a high degree of confidence, but for some, a medium degree of confidence, uh, especially with what respect to, uh, to food webs, for example, which is a key uh, question. The level of confidence is quite low on the impacts. Also, for the biogeochemistry, the, in the confidence levels are medium to, to low. And we have many knowledge gaps, unfortunately. Uh, one of them is, uh, as Anne Soto indicated, uh, we have information on mostly one driver at a time. Uh, and it's uh, very important to be able to estimate, to give projections, taking into consideration several drivers, at least the three major drivers that uh, Anne Soto uh, addressed in this presentation. We know very little about uh, evolutionary adaptation. That is the way organisms can adapt to those uh, new environmental uh, uh, parameters. Uh, this has happened in the past uh, during geological times. Uh, organisms have been able to adapt, but uh, the changes were very slow compared to what happens today. So biological adaptation is really a key issue to make um, useful and realistic projections. Most of the experiments have been performed at the level of organisms, and which is fine in the lab, but what we want to know is what happens in the field with natural communities when the, you take into account um, interactions between species. And as I said, food webs, uh, the effect on food webs is poorly, poorly constrained. Socioeconomic impacts, we are getting down or low in terms of uh, the confidence levels. We know that there are some 
effects already today on, in the aquaculture industry, especially uh, the aquaculture the, of oysters in the west coast of the US. An impact, potential impact on coastal protection. Uh, reefs, for example, if they are affected by bleaching and ocean acidification, are, do not function as a, as a key barrier to uh, the destruction of waves and uh, cyclones. Tourism, climate regulation, and carbon storage. Someone mentioned mangroves in, uh, earlier on. That's a key carbon storage also. But again, medium to low uh, confidence levels. I forgot to say, uh, here at the bottom, you have uh, the, the chapters, uh, the relevant chapters of the IPCC Working Group 2 report, which, uh, where, in which you can find more information on those things. So what are the policy uh, options for action? One is, uh, of course, the UNFCCC, the IPCC work, the uh, Rio, Rio Plus 20, the Convention of, on Biological Diversity, uh, is uh, also involved uh, geoengineering. This is <laughs> the place to be uh, for geoengineering this week. Um, and uh, also uh, regional uh, regulations and laws uh, which may uh, limit some of other stressors. Local stressors can be uh, decreased in order to increase resilience uh, to uh, global uh, stressors such as uh, warming and uh, acidification. And I like to uh, use this uh, graph uh, of Ken Caldera, who is here this week, I saw him this morning. Um, this graph, which I call the dented wheel, uh, really explains what's, what's happening. The, the desire that we have for uh, improving our well-being um, makes us uh, consuming uh, goods and services uh, in an increasing amount. Uh, so we consume energy, release CO2, um, uh, into the atmosphere, which leads to climate change, impacts humans and society and ecosystems, which is negatively affecting our uh, initial desire to, be, to improve our well-being. So this is uh, really counterproductive. And what we can do about it is indicated here, conserving um, goods and services, increasing the efficiency of the industry to manufacture those goods and services and, and consume less energy have clean energies that release uh, less uh, CO2 emissions. And uh, this is where I think uh, most of the action should take place because that's where it this graph here from Working Group 1, uh, the Working Group 1 of the IPCC really shows what the difference it makes uh, when you look at uh, RCP 2.5 or um, RCP 8.5 in terms of uh, pH, the projected pH can be stab stabilized uh, in the future if we decrease CO2 emissions, and it will continue to decline if uh, emissions continue uh, unabated to levels, as I said before, which have, have not been encountered by the oceans for the past 55 million years. It's really a dramatic decline. Um, the other uh, options here is uh, uh, of course, uh, CO2 remo removal, uh, one of the geoengineering uh, approach, uh, that makes a difference, of course, because uh, less CO2 we have in the atmosphere, less CO2 goes into the ocean and, and, uh, and less problematic uh, ocean acidification becomes. However, uh, solar geoengineering has almost no effect whatsoever on ocean acidification. It's very important to realize that uh, because the the purpose of this uh, technique is really to release CO2 without increasing temperature. But the CO2 that is in the atmosphere, mechanically, 25% of it goes into the ocean. So this is really, from the perspective of ocean acidification, that is not a technique that is uh, very uh, appealing, uh, quite the opposite. Um, then adaptation. Uh, Ansoto said that for many uh, processes and organisms and ecosystems, adaptation the scope for adaptation is limited. There is interestingly already adaptation taking place. Uh, I mentioned the oyster industry in the US. O already this industry has adapted by uh, monitoring pH, which goes into its tanks where uh, reproduction of oysters is taking place. So they are monitoring pH and closing down the pumps uh, in their facility and functioning in, as a closed system for, for a while. 
And uh, another adaptation to, uh, took place also. One of the uh, producers of larvae of oysters uh, relocalized its facility from the coast of Oregon to Hawaii, where ocean acidification is less of a problem. So finally, if we look at uh, uh, all those approaches to um, limit or, uh, ocean acidification on a plot which uh, shows the potential for limiting ocean acidification and the feasibility, the best option is really to reduce CO2 emissions or to remove uh, atmospheric CO2 once it is in the atmosphere. And the less desirable is solar radiation management, which has very little potential to ameliorate the situation for um, ocean acidification. Um, to conclude, uh, Dorothée asked me to address also what we are doing as a scientific community to interact with uh, the general public and policymakers. The, I would like to mention this Ocean Acidification International uh, Reference User Group, which uh, brings together scientists, policymakers, and uh, representatives from the industry. Um, it it complements uh, the work of the OAICC established at the IAEA in Monaco and advises uh, on the types of products uh, that we need to get out uh, with, hopefully with impacts. And several guides were product, produced. One of them is outside. And preparing for the Paris conference, this uh, uh, reference user group is uh, working on different products uh, to help uh, make the ocean more prominent in, the, in those negotiations. And uh, several products were, uh, as I said, uh, uh, published and made available to a different uh, arena. And uh, Carol Turley, one of the prominent uh, ocean acidification scientists, uh, attended uh, all the, the, f the last four COP uh, meetings. And we are getting ready for uh, the Paris meeting in 2015. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we'll be transitioning to a panel of three eminent international experts in uh, laws relating to the environment and climate change. I think we've heard the bad news about how dire the situation is in the ocean and how quickly these impacts are approaching. Uh, for those of us who look at international environmental law as a tool or international law in general, at least we have some hope of trying to stimulate national, international, and regional cooperation through these efforts. So my pleasure to introduce Professor Rob Karen Scott, who is professor in law, School of Law, University of Canterbury, New Zealand. Professor Scott teaches, researches, and publishes widely in areas of public international law, international environmental law, the law of the sea, and Antarctic law and policy. Her current research projects comprise, amongst others, the fragmentation of international environmental law. We are looking forward to hearing her views on regime fragmentation between the oceans and climate change and opportunities to fill possible legal and policy gaps. Well, thank you very much, Christina. It's a very great pleasure to be here, and thank you to the um, panel organisers for including me on this very interesting panel. Um, the organisers asked me to talk a little bit about the relationship between um, climate change, and in particular the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Um, as the title of the panel indicates, you've clearly got a um, relationship between sort of both atmosphere and oceans, so that automatically means for international lawyers that we've got multiple regimes and to an extent a fragmentation of regimes um, involved in the management of many um, climate change issues. So our two scientists um, this evening introduced uh, wonderfully the unholy trinity of impacts of uh, climate change on the ocean, acidification, warming and sea level rise. Um, and clearly to the extent that those impacts um, have implications for the health of the environment, the health of natural resources, that engages the environmental obligations under both uh, marine treaties and indeed potentially other treaties. Um, but it's also worth noting that the um, impacts of particularly warming and sea level rise also have implications for access to resources. 
Um, so, for example, if um, fish stocks uh, move, I think it was suggested in relation to temperature rises, um, then that one may well have implications for the application of regional fisheries management organisations and indeed access by coastal states. And that's very much an issue uh, which is of interest to law of the sea scholars. Um, similarly, in relation to sea level rise, um, one of the more crude consequences of sea level rise is, of course, coastal inundation and um, the, um, sub <coughs> the submergal of what we describe as base points. And that has implications for maritime delimitation and the um, extent of maritime zones. So whilst clearly environmental issues dominate um, the interests of law of the sea scholars, um, it's by no means confined to that. There's actually a whole range of um, political and resource and territorial issues which are potentially impacted um, by climate change. Um, equally, there are potential sort of um, opportunities or at least um, other issues which are raised by climate change which um, arguably deserve um, a specialist or a particular regulatory response. Um, in terms of geoengineering, which of course we've been discussing extensively over the last couple of days, um, ocean fertilisation has come up quite regularly um, and the, uh, we talk about the idea of sort of oceans as saviour and I must admit I've stolen that phrase from my colleague Rosemary Rafuse who first used it a couple of years ago at a conference in Wollongong. But essentially exploiting the oceans and new uses of the oceans, whether that's the water column in terms of fertilisation or indeed the seabed in relation to ocean sequestration, clearly require us to engage in um, different or, or potentially new rules or at least uh, the application of existing rules to new issues. In terms of opportunities, um, the last speaker talked a little bit about sort of the opening up of um, the sea ice in the Arctic, and of course there's a lot of interest in that area in relation to shipping. Um, well, that sim similarly has sort of implications, particularly for the regulation of shipping, um, and indeed there's initiatives going on at the moment in terms of developing rules to regulate shipping rather more tightly, uh, the polar code. And similarly also an Arctic-related opportunity in relation to potential new resources. So again, with the loss of ice, that may well uh, make it easier easier to access other resources such as oil and gas. And I guess if we're thinking very much long term, then potentially the Antarctic. But of course what all this means is that these are sort of um, new issues which law of the sea scholars need to engage in, either to develop new rules or at least to apply um, existing rules uh, to those issues. So in terms of the essential regime, the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea is really the central instrument um, which governs all activities taking place in the oceans. Um, it's a, a remarkable instrument, um, intended to be comprehensive, um, took nine years to negotiate, 12 to enter into force, um, and is often described as being a constitution for the oceans. So it establishes really those concepts and principles um, which apply across the board to, to all oceans activities. But it's also a framework convention, so it's by no means complete, and it very much relies on um, additional instruments, formally or informally, to plug the gaps to provide more detailed standards. And it's actually with these other instruments um, that... Um, there's been the greatest response to climate change issues because these are often more able to um, respond quickly and to develop into new areas. And I've just given a very few examples there. That's by no means um, an exhaustive list. Um, but you've got the various shipping and marine pollution conventions um, under the auspices of the International Maritime Organization, um, multiple regional fisheries management organizations, um, regional seas conventions, and then instruments which relate to biodiversity, so such as the Biodiversity Convention, the Migratory Species Convention, and there's actually a whole number I could uh, mention there. And in addition to that, we have sort of multiple, what we describe as sort of soft law initiatives or more um, 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 sort of a, a looser or more general options um, relating to issues such as coral reefs or land-based pollution. So there's actually a um, quite a complex system of rules which sort of interact to support uh, ocean management. So in terms of thinking sort of about regulating and particularly regulating oceans issues, it's quite useful, I think, to think about sort of the locus of regulations and where we might attempt to address some of these issues which arise from climate change. And we've actually got a range of options there. So some are quite clearly regulated by UNCLOS itself. Um, if not at the moment, then at least um, the um, uh, locus for future regulation lies very much within that convention. 
Um, a much greater number of issues are regulated by UNCLOS in addition to other agreements. Um, and I'm using the term sort of affiliated agreement in a fairly loose term, so apologies to the lawyers there. I'm not suggesting there's necessarily a, a formal affiliation, um, but essentially instruments which support um, UNCLOS. Um, there are then issues which are actually then regulated outside of UNCLOS, so actually are quite unconnected uh, with UNCLOS. And then finally, there are those which are not regulated. And what I'm going to do, I'm just going to give you sort of one or two examples of each of those, just to sort of demonstrate um, the connections or the lack of connections, um, before concluding with um, one suggestion um, to, for going forward in terms of sort of developing or improving oceans governance in the context of climate change. So the first example of an issue which is regulated by UNCLOS, um, or at least will be regulated uh, by UNCLOS, um, is that relating to sea level rise and its impact on, on baselines, maritime zones and maritime boundaries. So it's the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea that essentially set out the rules in relation as to where you can establish your maritime zones. And it's those rules which will apply um, in respect or at least in response to sea level rise. Now what we don't know at the moment is exactly what those rules are. There is a dispute as to whether you are able to fix your boundaries at some point, in which case they remain in place, even as sea level rises, um, or whether they are ambulatory, essentially, whether they move according to the geography of the coastline. Um, it's actually the latter interpretation, which is more consistent with UNCLOS, um, but of course the risk of that interpretation is that states start to lose their maritime zones, and those states which are particularly vulnerable to sea level rise um, are actually potentially at risk of losing their maritime zone altogether. So that's clearly an issue which we do need to address as law of the sea scholars and indeed policymakers and lawyers. Um, but it's very much an issue which is going to be addressed within the context um, of UNCLOS itself. A selection of issues where you've got both UNCLOS, but uh, more particularly it works alongside affiliated agreements, and it's also likely to be those agreements which address um, the issues more substantially. I'm um, just giving you three examples there. Um, the first in relation to sort of the environmental consequences, or at least some of the environmental consequences um, of climate change. So UNCLOS provides for quite a number of general statements of environmental principles, general obligations to protect and preserve the marine environment, and that would certainly apply to some of the consequences associated with climate change. But for the most part, those obligations are fleshed out by other treaties or other instruments, whether they relate to shipping or regional seas um, or indeed sort of biodiversity protection. So UNCLOS will provide sort of basic principles and it'll likely to work alongside these other instruments in terms of addressing some of the consequences, but clearly not all are regulated. Second example is in regulation in relation to shipping. Again, that's another issue which is regulated in principle by UNCLOS. General standards, but these are um, um, added to and uh, developed in quite a lot of detail um, by affiliated instruments. And as I say, the example of Arctic shipping um, is quite a good one there. And the third example is the sort of the selected potential climate-related uses of the ocean. So that's thinking about the ocean fertilisation, which Rosemary is going to talk a little bit more in detail, and also CO2 sequestration. So again, general principles within UNCLOS, but the detail of the regulation essentially is provided for other instruments, in this case the London Convention um, Protocol. In terms of issues which are regulated outside of UNCLOS, but nevertheless have an implication for uh, the health of the oceans, um, and that is um, emissions or sort of the broader cons uh, the causes of climate change itself. Um, there is a general provision under Article 212 of UNCLOS which relates to atmospheric pollution, a very general obligation requiring states to cooperate, to take action to manage atmospheric pollution. But essentially, the work relating to CO2 emissions has been delegated to the UNFCCC. So this is a, a disconnect, so as we've heard from our um, scientist, um, scientists at the beginning of this panel, um, quite significant implications, highly significant implications of emissions, but not something which is directly regulated by UNCLOS, and very little in the way of connection between UNCLOS and the UNFCCC. Uh, 
And then our final category are those which are not directly regulated. And of course, the obvious example here um, is ocean acidification. So it's not directly regulated by UNCLOS, although it is subject to general principles, um, and also not directly regulated at the moment by the UNFCCC. So that's an issue which really falls outside of both regimes. So it's really those two final categories, the not regulated and the regulated by other instruments, and to a lesser extent, the third category, uh, which are of real concern, I think, to international lawyers in terms of, of managing a coherent framework. So in terms of, of the potential ways of going forward, and there's clearly a range of um, options, and they're not in any way exclusive. It'll be a, a number of options. Um, but one option I think that we can pursue really quite quickly, and which I think would be um, at least effective in terms of process, um, is developing collaborative linkages between institutions. Now, this is actually um, initiatives which have been taken by quite a number of multilateral environmental agreements over the last five to ten years. It's actually quite an interesting uh, phenomenon. So these multilateral environmental agreements have increasingly actually entered into um, quite formal collaborative arrangements, often through memoranda of understanding, with other MEAs and potentially also other bodies, um, in order really to create mutually um, supportive collaborative relationships. So it allows for greater information exchange between institutions. It also allows for the development of joint work programs to fill gaps, to develop initiatives, um, to provide for sort of mutual support between uh, work programs. So just to give you a couple of examples, the uh, Biodiversity Convention is probably uh, the leading instrument um, in such initiatives. So it's um, actually adopted over 140 agreements with MEAs and other organisations, including universities, including um, uh, non-governmental organisations. Um, these vary. Some of them are pretty basic and are simply provide for information exchange. Um, but others are actually much more detailed in terms of developing joint programmes. Um, another example is the so-called chemicals cluster with the three chemicals um, conventions, um, the Basel, Stockholm and Rotterdam conventions. Um, and this is actually the most advanced of those arrange arrangements. There's a very formal structure between all three. And they actually share institutions. So there's an issue of actually sharing resources, managing institutional resources. So I think one of the options that we can definitely think about um, as lawyers and policymakers in this area is developing these formal collaborations between um, the UNCLOS and other marine-related institutions or marine uh, treaties and the UNFCCC and other institutions as appropriate in order to begin the conversation about issues such as ocean acidification and beginning to get the oceans much more onto the climate and atmosphere agenda. Um, so it's just a way of sort of beginning that sort of um, uh, cooperation and beginning to potentially develop work programs. And I think what's quite interesting, I was quite heartened to see that in the um, recent um, co-chair summary in relation to the um, BBNJ Working Group um, in April 2014, April this year, um, there's a very strong emphasis on collaboration, on cooperation, um, responding essentially to fragmentation through that cooperation um, and um, and connection. So that certainly seems to be something which is now being considered, um, at least in relation to a potential implementation agreement. So I think this is probably uh, potentially just one way forward um, and one way which would support um, other initiatives. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker will be uh, Rosemary Rafuse, who is professor, professor of International Law at the Faculty of Law the University of New South Wales in Australia. Professor Rafius researches and teaches in the area of public international law in general and more specifically on the law of the sea and international environmental law. She's, the editorial, she's on the editorial or advisory boards of a number of international law journals and is a member of the IUCN Commission on Environmental Law. She will provide us with a short outlook on climate engineering and its regime interactions. Thank you. At least you think that's what you're about to hear. Okay. <laughs> With the greatest of respect to Disney, I loved this quote of David Freestone's in an article that he published some time ago. Um, Despite the fact the world's oceans constitute the biggest sink of carbon dioxide and represent more than 30% of the global carbon cycle, no one has asked them to the bowl. And he was there referring to the climate change bowl, to the climate change negotiations. 
Just by way of example, when IPCC 4 came out, the fourth assessment report came out, there was not much on the oceans in it. The fifth assessment report has very much made up for that, particularly in working group two, with two full chapters and sections of other chapters dedicated to the oceans. And I have to say the chapter on ocean systems is very interesting reading indeed. Um, so now we have, from the IPCC, we have a great deal of evidence that tells us about just how bad things are, and they truly are bad. We know that there is a transformation of ocean systems as a result of climate change that poses very significant risks uh, for um, existing uh, marine biodiversity for the oceans themselves, but also for the international legal regimes that have been established to govern these um, ocean areas. Now, Karen has already given us a description of the uh, current international legal framework, uh, which I think by now you will have worked out is fairly fragmented, incoherent, uh, rather complicated, over and underlapping regime, which is ill-equipped, I would suggest, to respond to the challenges of spatial shifts and changes in phenology, um, species abundance, uh, species interactions that are going to be caused by climate change. And we've already heard it mentioned that that's going to be particularly problematic for uh, fisheries regimes and regional fisheries organizations. And to date, only very limited work has been done in a number of regimes related to the oceans with respect to climate change. Just to give you a quick overview, uh, the polar bear agreement, well, they are considered a marine mammal. Um, the polar bear's agreement is, in fact, in danger of losing its entire raison d'etre. The Convention on Migratory Species has done some studies showing the high vulnerability of species listed in its appendices. Uh, the World uh, Heritage Convention has explicitly recognized climate change as a real danger to some of the great iconic uh, coral reefs of the world. The Convention on Biological Diversity has formally recognized the threats posed by climate change, and so on and so forth. The UN General Assembly has, of course, called for very specific studies on the topic. Um, and to date, six, but I have to say in parenthesis, only six, of the uh, regional fisheries management organizations have taken what has been termed as action in respect to climate change since 1992. And by action, they mean talking about it. <laughs> but one of the main problems for all of these international regimes is that it's very difficult to separate out the effects of climate change from the effects of the other stressors on the marine environment, those other stressors that we've already heard about, overfishing, pollution, etc., etc. It also is difficult because it requires functioning of governance structures across a whole range of different scales and different jurisdictions, not something that international law has to date been very well equipped to do. And um, the difficulties of this interaction of the legal regimes is demonstrated very, very clearly by the problem that we've heard about earlier of ocean acidification and by proposals to enhance the ocean's capacities to absorb CO2 through activities like ocean fertilization. Um, and I talk about the problem of ocean acidification, the oceans being the victim of ocean acidification. We've already heard just how serious ocean acidification is. Um, it poses substantial risks to the marine ecosystems, especially polar ecosystems uh, and coral reefs that are associated with physiologic behavior of species and population dynamics, et cetera, et cetera. It also poses problems for the legal regimes that are dealing with these um, species. Now, where does international law fit into all of this? Well, that's where it gets difficult because ocean acidification is not uh, defined or specifically referred to in any binding international legal instruments. Um, instead, as with uh, marine biodiversity in general, there are a number of international legal regimes that may be relevant. Um, depending on whether the regulatory focus is the cause or the effect or both. Um, the problem of ocean acidification has been discussed in, for example, OSPAR um, and in the Commission on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources in the Arctic Council. It's also been discussed in the CBD. But there is no regime, no singular regime focus for ocean acidification in the oceans or anywhere else. Now, given that the main driver of ocean acidification is CO2 emissions, 
um, then basically the only way to address ocean acidification, as we've heard, is to reduce our CO2 emissions. And reduction of CO2 emissions is, of course, the concern of the Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, and the Kyoto Protocol. But the UNFCCC is concerned with atmospheric emissions. It defines climate change, it defines emissions in the context of atmospheric emissions and the effects on the atmosphere. Now, there is a provision that talks about uh, effects al involving alterations of the physical environment or biota resulting from climate change, which can, of course, be, be read to include marine uh, areas. But to date, the marine part of it has not come up in the discussions in the climate arena. And moreover, the Kyoto Protocol reinforces this atmospheric focus by suggesting that it calls for reduction of CO2 equivalent emissions, and it doesn't talk about any effects whatsoever on the oceans. And it doesn't even talk about reducing CO2. It's to reduce CO2 equivalent emotions, emissions. So states can reduce methane or other CO2 green, or other greenhouse gases, but not reduce CO2, which is not going to then assist with the ocean acidification um, issue. Moreover, um, the UNFCCC actually calls for the enhancement of global sinks, the largest of which, as we know, is the oceans. And this has been read as meaning not only that parties must act to enhance the passive absorption of anthropogenic CO2 into the oceans, but that we might also act to encourage active sequestration into the oceans. And that's been taken by some as an invitation to engage in controversial uh, marine geoengineering activities, such as ocean fertilization. And where you are going to regulate these active uh, CO2 sequestration activities is going to depend on how you characterize what is being done. And that is where we get to this notion, first and foremost, of CO2 emissions as pollution. There's the definition of pollution from the Law of the Sea Convention. If we define these CO2, or if we characterize CO2 emissions as pollution, it opens up a whole range of possible avenues for addressing, at least in part, their effects on the ocean. Um, the Law of the Sea Convention, of course, tells us that it's this intentional, or it's this introduction by man directly and indirectly of substances into the marine environment, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's the inherent uh, quality of the substance that is being introduced is not what's relevant, okay? So it doesn't matter if you are introducing something that is inherently benign. If it has a polluting effect, that is what is relevant. Um, so it may be possible to characterize the introduction either directly or indirectly of CO2 into the atmosphere, uh, or into the oceans, which is the main driver of acidification, as pollution. And of course, we know that all states have the obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment and to take measures to prevent, reduce, and control pollution of the marine environment from any source. And as Karen has already mentioned, the overall framework for this is in the Law of the Sea Convention, and it has now been uh, further detailed, the obligation set out in more detail in other treaty regimes, including the London Convention and the London Protocol, uh, which aim to prohibit dumping at sea unless it can be shown that the substances um, that are being dumped pose no threat to the marine environment. Now, where does this relate to carbon dioxide removal um, and uh, geoengineering issues? Well, uh, in, 19, sorry, in 2006, the London Protocol was amended uh, to permit sub-seabed sequestration of carbon dioxide. So it now permits certain CDR removal uh, uh, procedures and specific guidelines for the assessment of how this is going to be done have been, have been um, adopted. Um, but the risks of the adverse effects of ocean fertilization have been considered uh, strong or serious enough to warrant more binding regulation ultimately. And what has happened here is uh, some of you, many of you in the conference are probably well aware of this. You'll know that in 2007, uh, some commercial operators were proposing to uh, do, uh, carry out ocean, 
what they called ocean fertilization experiments, uh, dumping iron into the oceans to create phytoplankton blooms to um, basically suck down the CO2 from the atmosphere, etc. In addition to the scientific concerns that were being raised, there were a number of legal concerns being raised at the time as to whether this activity would constitute pollution or dumping. And if you go back to the definition of pollution, you could argue that it clearly constitutes pollution. But more specifically, we were fortunate enough to have a particular uh, treaty regime in place, the dumping regime, that appeared to be applicable. Dumping, being defined as the deliberate disposal of wastes or other matter from a vessel, an aircraft, or a platform, or other man-made structure at sea. But dumping does not include placement of matter for a purpose other than mere disposal, provided that such placement is not contrary to the aims of the Law of the Sea Convention. And so a number of legal issues arose. Well, you know, is the introduction of fertilizer into the ocean, is that placement? Uh, is iron or is another fertilizer, is it matter? Um, is it being done for a purpose other than the mere disposal thereof? And are the aims of this activity contrary to the aims of the Law of the Sea Convention or the London Convention and London Protocol, which are to prevent dumping and to protect the marine environment, etc.? I'm sure you're all aware of the history of the uh, activities in the LCLP to uh, consider ocean fertilization. In 2007, there was a statement of concern by the scientist uh, um, committee of the LCLP, and the uh, meeting of the parties decided to take it under consideration, intending to look at the possibility of regulating ocean fertilization activities. Um, and in a simultaneous or a parallel procedure, the Convention on Biological Diversity was also considering this and sort of jumped the gun in 2008, beat the LCLP to it, and adopted their moratorium on everything but small-scale localized experiments. And then in October 2008, the LCLP adopted first a non-binding uh, resolution disallowing ocean fertilization except for legitimate scientific research. And then in February 2009, they started work on an assessment framework for assessing whether these activities constituted legitimate scientific research. To make a long story short, uh, the voluntary assessment framework was adopted in 2012, and then uh, subsequently in 2013, the legally binding um, assessment framework was adopted. And this framework calls for a two-stage process. First, to decide whether the activity is legitimate scientific research, and then, if it is legitimate scientific research, you're to carry out uh, an, an adequate um, environmental impact assessment. And only once both of those stages have been completed properly can the research go ahead. Now, this is a wonderful example of one particular regime um, taking the bull by the horns, as it were, and dealing with one aspect of the geoengineering ocean interface. Interestingly, the amendments to the London Protocol, they don't just apply to ocean iron fertilization. They don't just apply to, iron, or to ocean fertilization. What they did was adopt an amendment that applies to all marine geoengineering acti geo activities listed in the particular annex. Currently, the annex only lists ocean fertilization, but there is the possibility that other activities will be listed. However, I have to with a little word of caution here. This is great, except that the London Protocol, of course, only applies to states parties to the London Protocol. And of course, it's a dumping convention, and it only applies to activities that are ship-based or man-made platform-based. It doesn't apply to activities where you have operators on shore who are piping fertilizing agents out into the ocean to create fertilizing blooms. It won't apply to activities in the atmosphere, um, which may have a knock-on effect on the oceans as a result of fallout from the atmosphere. Um, and it doesn't appear to uh, conventional, um, and I've put conventional in quotation marks there for a particular reason, aquaculture or mariculture. And the reason it's in quotation marks is because if you're a good lawyer and you're acting for a company that wants to do something along these lines, you'll find some way of arguing that uh, your placement of this fertilizer into the ocean is for aquaculture or mariculture purposes, regardless of what your true... Um, you know, ideas are. I don't wish to cast dispersions on operators, but it does seem to be that that's the way the world works. Um, for present purposes, I suppose the main issue here is the extent to which ocean fertilization contributes to ocean acidification. 
And uh, as I understand it, the answer to this remains unknown for certain processes, um, but also as I understand it from reading uh, the IPCC report since cold water absorbs more CO2 than warm water, um, if we have certain geoengineering processes that involve the pumping of cold water from the depth up into the um, upper layers of the water, then that will absorb more CO2, which will then increase the acidification of the oceans. I may be wrong on that. I leave that to the scientists to sort it out. But that was my understanding of the reading of it. Um, and that could then contribute to ocean acidification. And of course, as was already mentioned, SRM um, techniques aren't going to do anything whatsoever to stop ocean acidification. So uh, that's a very quick review of the legal system. Um, in conclusion, I'd like to say that whether the oceans are viewed as a victim of climate change or as part of the solution uh, for geoengineering or other purposes, there are a number of challenges for the law of the sea and oceans law and for international law in general, in particular, as Karen has discussed, the interactions between the different levels of international law and the different areas of international law, the sectoral fragmented nature of it. So although the law of the sea convention and the law of the other law of the sea treaties and institutions have an important role to play, they can't do it all. Um, and given the existing complexity and inadequacies, one might say, of the law of the sea regime, and in particular the overarching issue of ocean acidification, which requires a very complex consideration across a range of legal regimes, um, there's going to be a lot of work to be done and query, ultimately, whether the issue of ocean acidification, since it relies so much on the need to reduce uh, CO2 emissions is best placed in the uh, climate regime. So finally, what I would suggest to you is that the IPCC has given Cinderella her ball gown. The law of the sea is, well, sort of getting towards turning that pumpkin into a carriage. So she's dressed for the ball, the transportation is coming, but she's not there yet. Thank you. Yes. Well, well, thank you, Rosemary. We still have um, a long way to go before we actually get to the ball, but uh, our next speaker, Professor Daniel Badansky, may tell us at least how to get there. Uh, Professor Badansky is the Lincoln Professor of Law, Ethics, and Sustainability uh, at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at the Arizona State University in the United States. Professor Badansky has worked extensively on international climate change negotiations including as a senior negotiator in the U.S. Department of State and as a consultant to the U.N. Climate Change Secretariat and the Pew Center on Global Environmental Change. With that, please. Well, thanks very much. Um, as uh, Christina said, I'm primarily a climate change person rather than an oceans person, so I've really enjoyed this panel and I've learned a lot uh, about the ocean, so I uh, thank you all for that. Um, let me just say, in the world of climate negotiators, where, which I largely inhabit, uh, the focus tends to be uh, on impacts on terrestrial ecosystems because countries are in terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, and the focus tends to be on how climate change will affect countries because that's a motivation hopefully for countries to take action to deal with climate change. And there's also the issue of uh, compensation to countries for the damage they're going to suffer from climate change. But I think it is the case, I think it's fair to climate negotiators to say that uh, the impacts on the oceans are not unknown. I think they are deeply appreciated by climate uh, negotiators. I think that is understood in the climate world. Uh, that the effects of climate change are not just going to be on countries, it's going to be on uh, the uh, global commons as well, uh, our, uh, polar regions, uh, the oceans. So I think that is understood. Now, I was asked to reflect a little bit on the relationship uh, between the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, the principal treaty dealing with climate change, and ocean issues. Uh, and let me just start by reflecting a little bit on interactions between different international regimes in general and climate change in particular. So climate change is an extremely broad issue. Uh, so not surprisingly, it has interactions not only with the oceans regime, 
but with virtually every other regime uh, you can imagine. So uh, a lot of discussion on the interaction of the climate and trade regime, uh, the interactions between the climate change and the intellectual property regime, uh, the relationships with a whole series of other environmental uh, treaty systems, not just uh, law of the sea and oceans issues, but biodiversity, world heritage, wetlands, and so forth and so on. So because climate change is a tremendously broad issue, uh, the kinds of issues about the interactions of UN Framework Convention and oceans is not a unique issue. That's an issue that's pervasive throughout the climate change area. And so let me just start by, I think, categorizing the relationships one can have between different treaty regimes into a couple of few different types. Uh, because I think that's helpful. So on, uh, ideally, of course, uh, treaty regimes or different regimes are going to be uh, mutually reinforcing, uh, helpful to one another. Uh, that would be the ideal, that they're working uh, uh, synergistically together to achieve some uh, goals that each of them share. Uh, secondly, you can have simply coexistence, coexistence where they're not really helping one another or they're not really harming one another. And then finally, you can have conflict, and of course, that's the most problematic, where regimes are working at cross purposes. Now, I think it's fair to say that uh, in many cases, uh, the regime interactions don't fall into a single uh, of these categories. They can fall into multiple categories at the same time. Let me just take the trade and uh, climate change regimes as an example. It's often said that uh, seen as that there's a conflict between the trade regime and the climate regime, and there certainly are some conflicts because some climate protection measures might raise trade concerns and be challenged in the WTO uh, legal system. At the same time, there also can be uh, complementarities between the trade regime and the climate regime because to the extent we can deal with energy subsidies, uh, which lead to higher fossil fuel emissions, we're achieving both objectives on the trade side and on the climate change side. Same is true with the interaction between the ozone regime and the climate change regime. Uh, ozone depleting substances in some cases are also uh, greenhouse gases, so to the extent we can phase out uh, ozone depleting substances, we're also helping climate change. And actually, the single agreement that's done the most to help the climate change problem is not the Kyoto Protocol, it's the Montreal Protocol because they did an accelerated phase out of uh, HCFCs, which are ozone depleting substances, but also uh, greenhouse gases. And so that's been a tremendous help to the climate system. At the same time, one of the principal replacements for ozone depleting substances, HFCs, is a greenhouse gas. So to the extent the Montreal Protocol is encouraging the replacement of HCFCs with HFCs, it's helping the ozone layer, but it's hurting the climate system. So again, Montreal Protocol, the ozone regime, and the climate regime in some cases can be complementary, in other cases conflicting. So let me, with that just background, turn to the interactions between the Framework Convention on Climate Change, the climate regime, and the ozone regime. And I guess I would describe it as to some degree complementary because of course if we can address climate change that will be a tremendous benefit to the oceans. But as a legal matter, in terms of the legal interactions, I would describe it more as coexistence. So the title of the panel for tonight was the Ocean Climate Divide. I would maybe say it's less of a divide than a division of labor, uh, maybe to put a positive spin on this. Uh, they're not really, I don't think in very many cases, actually in any conflict with one another, uh, but they don't really, they, they just mutually uh, coexist. Uh, now, uh, as I said, the um, uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change is the primary international instrument addressing the climate change uh, problem. It was adopted in 1992. It essentially serves the same function for climate change that the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which Karen talked about, serves for the oceans. It provides the overarching governance structure to address the climate change uh, problem. It establishes some general principles, institutions, and so forth. Um, uh, the Climate Change Convention now is more than uh, 20 years old. Uh, I've been following it since its inception, so it shows you how long I've been involved in this issue. Um, and uh, currently where we are in the uh, development of the climate change regime uh, is to negotiate some new international instrument addressing the problem. Uh, those negotiations began in Durban a couple of years ago. The negotiations are underway. Uh, there are multiple meetings going on each year. Uh, the next major meeting is gonna be in Lima, Peru uh, in December of this year. And this is supposed to culminate with the adoption of some new instrument addressing the climate change problem in 2015 in Paris. And so it's already being referred to sometimes as the Paris Agreement or the 2015 Agreement. 
Uh, exactly what that agreement looks like uh, is still unclear. Uh, there's relatively little consensus in the climate negotiations, so one never really knows exactly what the outcome will be until the actual end of the meeting, which now in the climate negotiations usually ends several days after it's supposed to end because they can't reach agreement uh, in time. Um, so uh, I think it is the case uh, that the oceans don't figure prominently uh, in the negotiations. It provides a backdrop. One of the main in incentives to deal with the climate change problem is to address uh, all of the different impacts, including the impacts on the oceans. But the oceans don't figure uh, sort of independently in the negotiations. And let me just say that while I'm a, a uh, highly critical of the Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, I think it uh, has not been a very successful agreement. I think it's a little unfair to criticize the Climate Change Convention for not dealing with the oceans because, frankly, the Climate Change Convention has a lot on its plate already. It's already burdened with uh, too much. It's not being very successful in dealing with what's on its plate. So putting more on its plate, uh, I think, makes, uh, just puts an additional burden. Um, it's being used, the Climate Change Convention, to deal with not just the climate change problem, but a whole host of other problems, global uh, economic inequities. Uh, major focus of a lot of the negotiations is to use the Climate Change Convention to uh, redress uh, global economic inequities. Uh, uh, to try to uh, expect the Climate Change Convention to be able to deal not just with the climate change problem itself, which is a tremendously difficult problem to deal with politically, but to deal with all the other problems of the world, I think is uh, uh, expecting too much. So uh, while I'm uh, not going to be defending the Climate Change Convention, I do think that uh, expecting it to deal with uh, other problems, uh, you know, let it try to deal with the climate change problem, and if it's successful in dealing with the climate change problem, it's not going to deal with all of the problems of the oceans. Ocean acidification, tremendous problem also, uh, but at least it will be a huge benefit to the oceans uh, if the climate change regime is, uh, is uh, successful in addressing uh, the climate change problem. So let me just turn to a little bit, just very specifically and quickly, um, some of the uh, ways that the Climate Change Convention uh, addresses uh, uh, oceans issues. It doesn't really do a lot, so this is going to be quite brief. Um, I think you can think about it in terms of the causal directions going in both ways, how the oceans affect uh, the climate and then how the climate affects the uh, oceans. Uh, so let me start with the first because that can be dealt with very quickly. So the um, uh, Climate Change Convention is trying to deal with uh, uh, anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases. But the emissions that it does not address, that it explicitly carves out, are emissions from global transport. Uh, and that includes uh, civil aviation, but also maritime transport. So emissions uh, on the oceans, uh, activities on the oceans that produce emissions, uh, those are not addressed under the UN Framework Convention. Those were specifically given to the International Maritime Organization uh, as the relevant uh, UN body uh, addressing maritime shipping. And actually, I have to say, They've been much more successful in dealing with, not they've been very successful, they've been more successful in dealing with maritime emissions uh, than the Framework Convention has been dealing with uh, terrestrial emissions because the uh, international agreement dealing with uh, emissions from ships, the MARPOL agreement, adopted an amendment uh, a couple of years ago that actually now puts in place an efficiency standard, required efficiency standards, uh, to try to reduce emissions uh, from maritime transport. Now, of course, the bigger uh, questions deal with the ways that uh, the effects on the oceans, the effects on the oceans uh, related to the climate change problem. And I guess I'd divide those into three categories. There are the effects uh, due to climate change. Uh, there are the effects due to uh, various activities, human activities uh, that cause climate change that also cause other uh, oceans problems. That's ocean acidification. Uh, and then there are the effects due to activities to mitigate climate change. And, uh, geoengineering falls into that category. So that, that's the way I divide them up. So let me deal with just them very quickly in order. The effects on the oceans of climate change itself, uh, so those were addressed in some of the earlier talks uh, in a very interesting manner. These are going to be huge. Um, the effects of climate change on the various ecosystems, including the oceans, are going to be uh, very high damages. Um, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change doesn't single out the oceans. Uh, in terms of the impacts, but it doesn't single out other ecosystems either. So it's not discriminating against the oceans. It's an equal opportunity uh, in terms of not addressing any uh, specific ecosystem. Uh, now, I think the, the one case where maybe it's, it's similar, for example, to uh, the World Heritage Convention. So 
uh, various World Heritage sites may be uh, basically uh, eliminated as a result of climate change. And so uh, the question is, you know, how to address that? Uh, where do you address that? Do you address that in the World Con Heritage Convention or in the Climate Change Convention? Uh, but so the effects of climate change are going to be felt on all sorts of different ecosystems, including the oceans, and Climate Change Convention doesn't deal with any of them in particular. Now, I think there is a little bit of a difference with um, the oceans in that there is a duty in the Climate Change Convention to adapt to the effects of climate change. Uh, those are on states, uh, and that's dealing with adaptation in their territories. So there's the question of how do we adapt to climate change if we can, and I gather there's very limited things we can do to adapt. How do we adapt on the oceans? There's really, that duty doesn't fall on any particular state uh, because the duty of states to adapt, I think, is really dealing with uh, adaptation in their territories, at least as I think uh, as I would understand it. Um, so that is, I think, a gap, perhaps. Now, uh, I think, though, some of the earlier talks made that gap perhaps less problematic because to the extent that the effects on the oceans are then interconnected with other effects on the oceans, uh, and it's very hard to separate out the climatic effect with other effects, perhaps it is better to deal with adaptation to the extent we can at all, not in the Climate Change Convention, but in other forms focused on the oceans more specifically. Um, now, the effects on the oceans of CO2 emissions, so this is not effects due to climate change itself, it's due to uh, CO2, uh, ocean acidification. Uh, UN Framework Convention really doesn't uh, specifically address. Uh, there is, of course, a lot of interest in the climate change community about ocean acidification. There are side events on ocean acidification, so this is not an issue that is outside the uh, understanding of the climate change world, but the Climate Change Convention is not specifically uh, addressing that. And as Rosemary said, uh, it is trying to reduce greenhouse gas uh, emissions in the aggregate. So it, uh, it's taking a comprehensive approach, not focused specifically on CO2 emissions, but focusing on CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, and uh, various other trace gases that are greenhouse gases. So uh, that, of course, is uh, um, uh, doesn't focus specifically on the problem of ocean acidification. I guess I would argue that we want to get the most, the, the best thing we can do for the oceans is to reduce climate change. So to the extent by focusing on multiple gases and trying to reduce the overall level of greenhouse gas emissions, I think that's good not just for the climate change, but also for the oceans. Uh, I guess I would question whether you took a CO2 only approach, focusing only on CO2, whether the result would be uh, more reductions of CO2 or simply less reductions of other greenhouse gases, and I think that's uh, the question one has to ask. Uh, and then finally, uh, on the question of, um, uh, uh, and, and by the way, let me say one more thing about CO2. The, the ocean acidification is not uh, unique. Uh, there are many other uh, effects of fossil fuel emissions on other environmental problems, and usually those are seen as being uh, in a sense, a positive from the climate change side because it provides an extra incentive for countries to act. It provides co-benefits. You get, if you reduce your fossil fuel use, you get not only the benefit of climate change, but you get the benefit of reduced uh, urban air pollution and other kinds of effects. I would say ocean acidification, I think of as in the same way, that you get a co-benefit of reducing CO2 emissions. It's not only good for the climate, it also is good for ocean acidification. So I think this is not something unique to CO2 emissions and ocean acidification. It's true of uh, a lot of other of the effects of activities that cause climate change on other environmental problems. And then finally, effects on oceans of addressing climate change. Uh, so this is really the geoengineering issue. Um, the UN Framework Convention uh, does not address geoengineering very specifically. Geoengineering, to the extent it's being addressed at all, is being addressed in other forums like the um, London Protocol, London Convention. Uh, in my view, that's appropriate. Uh, uh, Climate Change Convention, again, as I say, has enough to be doing already. To the extent we can address it effectively in other forums like the London Convention, I think that's fully appropriate. So with that, I'll end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all our speakers, and I think it clearly showed not only the complexity of the problem and uh, the efforts that are being undertaken to address it from various angles, but also that the conceptual frameworks and legal frameworks that we're starting from do not easily bring these complex problems together in a legal, in a governance kind of regime, and the fact that the high seas is
one large space that reflects a failed state rather than a well-governed commons does not make it any easier. Now, we are out of time, but um, if there is any urgent question, I would ask for it now. Otherwise, I will take this opportunity to... There is a question right there. It is. Okay, uh, my name's Ian Simpson. Uh, uh, a little uh, question, really. When, when was the process first really understood about oceans absorbing warming? Because uh, global warming rebranded climate change has been going on for quite some time. And I first read about the oceans absorbing all this heat somehow uh, less than a year ago in The New Scientist. And I had not ever heard of that process before. So, how well is that process understood? When was it first recognized? And at what point does the ocean release all that hate? And, and what Thank process underlines, underlines that as well? Because it all Parker. seems a bit kind of sudden. I, I cannot give you the exact history of, of obs observations of uh, the oceans taking up heat. Um, what I can tell you is that in the Working Group 1 report of the IPCC that was published in September 2013, there is an oceans observations chapter which which uh, summarizes all the evidence that is there and came up with a figure of 93% of the heat taken up by the oceans so far, which also means that, in, uh, based on simple physical grounds, that the oceans will not only buffer in terms of future warming, but if we go into a world that will decrease emissions and reduce CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, the oceans will also buffer the other way around and, and release heat and, and thereby de delay, delay the recovery of climate in the, in the terrestrial realm, if you, if you so wish. So there is, is two sides to this, to this coin. Another issue is, I think, which is very relevant is um, that this buys us time, that's true. But in, in terms of committed climate change, we're pretty much on track for the next 20 to 30 years in, in terms of how the climate will change, will be changing on, on the planet before actually it will make any difference between the different emission scenarios with respect to the future climate by the end of this century and, and beyond, telling us that we really need to think on, on long time scales. But these, just to come back to your original question, these, these ocean observations have been going on for, for some decades, and, and such long-term data series are needed to really come up with conclusions about uh, how much heat the oceans have actually taken up. Thank you. There was a question over there. Um, Terry Lawton, uh, environmental activist from Ireland. Um, wh why, why is it such a certainty that um, that's, uh, that's CO2 is the main driver of ocean acidification? I never hear um, any other external factors brought into the equation, such as current geoengineering programs, which are taking place around the planet now, and all of the materials that are being used to facilitate these programs, such as aluminium oxide, which is not only being dumped on the oceans on a daily basis around the world, but it's also been dumped uh, on land, which is evident uh, through s thousands of soil samples now. And the soils, soil all around the world is acidifying. So um, my question is, wh why, isn't, why isn't geoengineering brought into the equation uh, when considering um, ocean acidification? Okay, CO2 is the, by far the main um, reason for ocean acidification. There are minor contributors. I think the one you mentioned is uh, extremely tiny. I mean, compared to the volume of the ocean, there is no chance that this dumping can affect in, a, in significantly um, when you compare it to the uptake of uh, CO2 by the oceans, 24 million tons a day. Uh, 
The other contributors which can be significant at a local or regional scale are uh, eutrophication, that is uh, the release of uh, organic carbon by the estuaries and rivers, uh, which um, then cause uh, hypoxia as well as acidification in very coastal waters. And another contributor is uh, the deposition of uh, acidic uh, substances from the atmosphere, such as sulfur, uh, which has caused in the past, uh, in Europe especially, uh, acidification of, st of streams and lakes. These are the two uh, minor contributors to ocean acidification, but by far CO2 is uh, the, the greatest contributor. Well, thank you again all for attending, and thank you so much to our panelists. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you.